everybody. Welcome to today's conversation at the Posh Board, where we're talking about what the Posh Act means at the workplace and some of the concerns, questions, challenges, and even best practices that uh, Posh practitioners have brought to the table. We've talked about the Act itself, constituting the IC, uh, looking at uh, the structure around anonymity uh, in the Act, and Bishan, we've also kind of touched on why the Act is so specifically protective of women. Right? You go back and watch those episodes. <laughs> um, today, I, I want to pick your brains on kind of like a, a corollary uh, to that conversation. Right? Uh, something that is true in our culture and, and something that has been generationally transmitted, uh, right, for, for, for many, many years is, and, and I briefly talked about it earlier also, the social stigma around uh, sexual harassment. To the extent where I know as a parent, I have definitely spoken uh, to, to uh, my daughter about this, that when a woman is in any way uncomfortable in a situation uh, where there is a sexual uh, connotation, it could be somebody whistling at her on the streets, right? Um, the advice very, very often is uh, put your head down, pretend you didn't hear it and walk away from the situation. Don't confront the, the issue, right? And then it co along comes the Posh Act, which specifically says, hey, woman with a complaint, you know, you need to go and approach your IC. You need to identify yourself. You need to share information with the IC, very specific. And we know that sexual harassment more often than not occurs privately and without witnesses, the very nature of, of uh, you know, the situation. Yeah. So when you have a complainant who comes to the IC and says, and, and normally we refer to this as a he said, she said situation, right? Mm. So the complainant has brought a complaint to the IC. The respondent says, nope, it didn't happen. Uh, how does the IC take the first steps in, in a situation like that? Yeah, big problem. Big problem, Lakshmi. I'm sure as a member on the IC multiple times, you've dealt with this hands-on multiple times. Yeah. But I think the short answer for everyone to remember is that the standard of proof to be implemented in a sexual harassment investigation situation is very different from the standard of proof that we imagine uh, in a criminal investigation. And that standard of proof in a criminal investigation for murder, theft, etc. is beyond reasonable doubt. The court has to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that this individual is guilty of the crime. Mm -hmm. right? And we assume that sexual harassment is a crime and therefore the similar, st similar standards must apply. Quick aside, sexual harassment is a crime, right? Section 354A of the IPC also has sexual harassment as a crime. And the what constitutes sexual harassment there is very similar to what constitutes sexual harassment under the Posh Act, right? Uh, except that there isn't the last line which says any other unwelcome act. So the criminal law is a little bit more tight on what sexual harassment is. And if we were in court discussing whether a certain action is a sexual harassment or not, pursuant to a criminal complaint, then we would be following the standard of beyond reasonable doubt. Sure. But when we are looking at whether there is sexual harassment or not in a posh situation, which is a complaint raised by an employee before uh, a, a com before an IC, it's a very different standard we follow. And the standard we follow here is preponderance of probabilities, right? Preponderance of probabilities or balance of convenience are a couple of the phrases that are used, uh, which effectively means that the IC only has to come to a decision mm -hmm. on is it more likely that sexual harassment happened or that it didn't happen. And when we say more likely, it is in the mind of the IC, the collective mind of the IC. Is it more than a 50% chance essentially that sexual harassment has happened or that it, did, that it didn't happen? You don't have to reach the beyond reasonable doubt uh, threshold. Okay. So that's that's the one big thing to keep in mind. I'll pause here. Lakshmi, if you want to step in on examples or your experiences as a member on the IC on dealing with these situations. Yes. So a couple of different things, right? I mean, one is definitely in terms of okay, the, the complainant in her complaint has raised certain or, or described certain specific situations, right? Hmm. Um, certain such thing happened while we were wherever, here, here or there. You know, for, for example, um, this person um, asked me to stay back after my shift and we stepped into a meeting room hmm. and the situation occurred inside the meeting room where there was nobody, right? 
The other flip, and 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 this is something that because I don't have a legal background, I don't have this this kind of training, right? And we've also seen the law does not say that you have to have only legal, um, you know, uh, legally trained people on, on the IC. So so for many of us in the IC, that's also a part of the struggle, right? Mm-hmm. You you talked about balance of uh, probabilities, and and the law says what's the evidence? Mm-hmm. Now the complainant says. This situation happened, as I said, you know, back inside the meeting room. The door is closed. Yeah. There's nobody there. Um, and I'm telling you, I see, it did happen. Mm. And I was traumatized by this. Respondent says, nope, it didn't. Mm. Or respondent could also say, well, it wasn't meant in that way, mm. right? Mm. Um, so, so then the IC says, we need the evidence. Mm. And complainant... What do we do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you tell the complainant, you know, please... Tell me, how can we, we you know, uh, from the IC's perspective, it's not about trust and faith and belief, right? Hmm. It is, at the end of the day, a legal responsibility that the IC has. And we've got to take evidence into into consideration. Hmm. But there's no evidence. So, okay, let's, let's spend, I suppose, most of this episode, the entirety of this episode, discussing what those examples are, because that's what it comes down to, mm-hmm. right? I can sit here and say... Uh, preponderance of probabilities, balance of convenience. But if you cannot implement that based on the evidence that you have, uh, there's little value in knowing what the uh, standard of proof is, right? So one thing to remember, again, different from a criminal kind of situation where you need direct evidence. In a criminal case, you need direct evidence, right? Of the witness having seen, heard, experienced something. In a posh situation, you don't need direct evidence. You can deal with circumstantial evidence. And what is circumstantial evidence? Um, Let's say that I was sitting in a room with uh, the victim and I have seen embarrassment on her face or I have seen uh, that she she is upset, right? Uh, That's my perception of the situation. Mm. And there may be someone else who shares that perception. Now, before a court, that's not direct evidence. That's not adequate evidence to convict. But in this situation... You can because you have a lower standard to achieve. You don't have to achieve beyond reasonable doubt, right? You only have to achieve balance of convenience. So this kind of evidence you can take into consideration, which may be seen with the other evidence that you have, which we'll discuss examples of, could be helpful, mm-hmm. right? Or the allegation uh, by the woman is that uh, so and so person harassed me when I was in the washroom, mm-hmm. right? Nobody was there in the washroom, but I was standing outside the washroom when I saw her leave. Uh, in a haste and looking distraught yeah. right now that evidence which I provide to the IC could be useful to the IC to uh, possibly see the truth in the complaint because it's unlikely that at the point in time when it happened she was faking her uh, sorrow and running out of the washroom right so those kind of pieces of evidence do help an IC and the circumstantial evidence could be adequate to come to the conclusion that uh, the, there was sexual harassment happening in this case or there wasn't, right? So that that can ultimately be quite helpful. Let's discuss a couple of more examples. Actually, I do want to share something with you. And, and it's so interesting what, what you brought up, right? And, and linking it back to what we talked about, the, the handshake business. So, so this is a complaint that was brought to an IC that I was a part of. Mm-hmm. And the complaint, the, the, the woman complained that, look, our manager has this rule that when our shift starts and as we come into work, um, he's always uh, there at the office before our shift starts, right? Each one of us, all of us, both, both the, the men and the women who work in the team, all of us have to go up to him, shake his hand and say good morning and, you know, uh, make the, the usual morning pleasantries. Now, for me, uh, when, uh, you know, and, and this is the complainant saying, uh, speaking, right? So, so she says that when the, the manager shakes her hand, uh, A, he holds on to her hand a little longer. Mm. And B, he makes an inappropriate touching, uh, you know, mm. uh, this thing, right? So, so she came and said, people can't see it because obviously I mean when you're shaking hands you can't uh, this thing and the assumption is why is she, why is only she so sensitive mm. um, I spoke to somebody else on my team who used to be on my team and, and she's transferred to a different team and she said she faced the same problem mm. but again could not speak up about it because nobody knows mm. so how does an IC handle because this is literally a he said she said because he's saying I shake everybody's hand not just hers 
So yeah, so there's no one correct answer, honestly, mm. right? But I think the example I gave before of uh, someone seeing her reaction to it or someone seeing her experience to it could be helpful. Or in this case, after the handshake happened, right after, most likely she's gone and had a conversation with somebody about it. Yes. And said, this happened to me, right? So generally, uh, courts and in ICs, which essentially have the powers of a civil court as well, tend to believe that immediate reaction post the happening of the event mm. and that kind of reaction must be given adequate weight mm. so right after the event has happened if you know that she has gone and spoken to her someone in confidence and said that you know uh, he held my hand a certain way it was inappropriate it was a lingering handshake it was a touch was inappropriate whatever that has to be given weight by the IC mm. right so when I said let's talk about examples it's a great example mm. of examples of in this kind of situation what would be evidence mm. maybe this is evidence mm. you said that she knew somebody else who had experienced something similar mm. so if she says that to the ic the ic should be able to say let's call that person on as a witness mm. let's hear that person as well mm. so this is there's no reason to disbelieve the woman here because it's not an isolated incident mm. there is some kind of pattern mm. so if you can establish some kind of pattern mm. even if nobody's actually seen that very handshake happen right there could be evidence enough to find guilty so these are a couple of evidences that could have been used in this example so you're saying if there is a question mark if the IC has a question mark hmm. and feels that perhaps the situation did in fact occur hmm. that the IC can then reasonably you know by w- when, when they're talking to themselves um, and, and going back to the wonderful 3-2 right um, that that they can actually find uh, you know like and, and formally find that the likelihood of such a situation or such a complaint being valid is greater yeah. than the um, unlikelihood. Correct, correct. And like in this situation itself, now it cannot be that she is in isolation, right? She is in the. This is happening in the workplace. She is mm. going to be sitting at her workstation. Mm. She is going to be in the proximity of other employees, mm. right? So even assessment, like the first example I gave, the, her, the assessment of her facial expressions, her body language mm. in the office, pursuant to an incident mm. where she may have experienced some trauma, mm. could be telling, mm. right? So the IC's obligation is then to go out and try to find that evidence, mm. right? To the people sitting around her mm. to see, again, this is how it's different from a court case because in a criminal setting, it's the obligation of the complainant mm-hmm. to provide the evidence, yes. right? In yeah. this situation, it's an also the obligation of the IC to go and find the evidence. Mm. It's a it's a way in which it's different, right? Yeah. Because a judge doesn't go out and do that in a court setting. But here you are the judge, but you can also be the investigator. It is a posh investigation, right? So you can go out and try and speak to the people around her. See if there's an assessment of facial expressions, body language, whatever it is. Mm. Conversations that could help in that situation. All kind of examples that, you know, yeah. come together to either prove guilt or the lack of it. So you're saying almost like wearing an investigating officer's hat, right? Mm, mm. Talking to people and finding out a little bit more contextual yeah. around this and, and um, you know, trying to get to a place where the IC can reasonably take a call. Yeah. Yes, it happened or, you know, no, no, it uh, didn't happen. We're also seeing that, uh, again, you know, going back to sexual harassment, tending to happen in private or, uh, you know, without these open witnesses. But we're also seeing, um, you know, young women who talk to their friends about it, not Mm. necessarily friends at the workplace, Mm. but also maybe friends outside the workplace, right? Somebody who, and and again, um, going back to the whole social stigma, the, the, you know, the context around the need to identify myself. As a, as, as a woman who has faced sexual harassment, I will look for people that I'm more comfortable talking to. Mm-hmm. And these need not necessarily be people within the organization. Um, is there any value to that conversation that, that an IC can use or will appreciate? No, absolutely. I mean, the conversation that the victim has with the third person outside the office will have the same value as someone within the office. Mm. Just because it's sexual harassment at the workplace, it doesn't mean that the evidence must come from the workplace. Mm. Absolutely not. But I suppose the more time that passes between the event and the conversation, uh, the less, I also don't want to say the less believable it becomes, but I suppose the more believable it is, the more proximate the events are. Right, because there's not enough time to fake a reaction, there's not enough time to fake emotion. 
if the harassment has happened in the washroom you've come out distraught spoken to a person there it's natural that that will have more value not yeah. to say that the other evidence will not have value just that on a weight of evidence it's likely that the person who is more proximate will have more value yeah and 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 that's kind of a little thing because yes the law does say that you know you've got to make the 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 complaint within 3 months ish of the other uh, thing there's some nuances to that but then there's also again the the cultural uh, this thing of uh, you know i mean something happened yesterday you're complaining today oh my god why are you being so sensitive and you know hmm. where's the hurry of raising the complaint and then something happens earlier on and you wait and then you think oh so what were you doing all of this time you know mm. what what were you thinking of um th- there is that challenge that that yeah. uh, you know kind of uh, women face so so how about and and again i'm i'm looking in today's world where i think all of us are so much more conscious around well being and mental health mm. what if uh, this woman says I spoke to a counselor about it. I spoke to a hmm. therapist about hmm. it. Hmm. We do know that there is, you know, uh, health in in the healthcare world there is that patient privilege, right? Yeah. Um how can an IC or can an IC uh use that information to help guide them towards a conclusion? No, most definitely can, but you will know that any therapist or doctor uh will not break that privilege no. and therefore uh when you go to a therapist or doctor for this kind of uh, evidence mm. if you are able to get the consent of the victim mm. the complainant before you do that and get them to waive privilege mm. right because after all the doctor or therapist is only protecting their privilege there is no other privilege that is protecting so if you are able to get them to waive that privilege you can definitely take that evidence on board and that will mm. be quite substantial in terms of finding guilt or the lack of guilt mm. but i want to add like uh, what the conversation with the therapist is just another example where you may find similar evidence yeah. from experience is in the diary of the individual mm. right uh, very often if if they have not had a conversation with a friend or a confidant uh, maybe they haven't gone to a therapist or a doctor but there is still evidence in the diary that they maintained mm. right the event happened 2 months ago 3 months ago like you're saying but the diary from 3 months ago has a page on the incident that happened mm. right which adds to the believability of the uh, accusations the allegations mm. so there are even in the absence of any evidence there could still be evidence and all these examples we are talking about is for the benefit really of ic members to look for these kind of evidences mm. you know this this also this other uh, this thing of uh, you know f- from an ic's perspective and and again like i said we're all humans so although we try to be from fr- uh, you know s- sitting in the ic wearing a hat of impartiality and fairness and respect towards all which which is uh, really true but there's also this this kind of gut feel right i mean i i kind of instinctively believe uh a particular situation occurred or didn't occur mm. um how does an ic uh, overcome that or maybe manage that to ensure once again not ensure but but to get to a place where there is a, a consensus decision that's possible it's a good question lakshmi but i think the answer is that the ic just have to overcome mm. that tendency mm. to uh lean a certain way mm. i mean your gut instinct for any investigator is important and you must follow your gut and but you must follow your gut to chase the evidence mm. you mustn't follow your gut to conclude that's right a good point, yeah. so uh, all of these examples that we are come thinking about now and discussing are what the ic if they have a gut feeling leaning a certain way must go and hunt down yeah. and if you hunt and don't find then i suppose there is a reason to conclude regardless of what your gut tells you at the end there's a reason to conclude in the negative saying the harassment didn't happen possibly okay. right another example is what i just want to keep giving as many examples as i can <laughs> is in the absence of people now if the type of harassment takes some you know skill so to say in that it requires you to hack into a system it requires you to you know uh, send uh, messages which are uh, you know through your email which you click can you know whatever that possibly needs a certain amount of studying for the individual and if you are in a workplace situation and we're discussing harassment at the workplace there's a good chance that they are using office laptops or office phones to search for ways to hack to access other people's phones laptops etc so if you're able to go into the browsing history and as an employer if it's your 
of official property you have the right to do that so ic can access it you may have evidence over there mm. their search history may give you evidence about what it was so those are little kind of things that uh, could be helpful yeah so, so so let's say and and you know from from an ic's perspective right they've tried they've they've you know looked for other thing they've asked mm. both sides both both the the complainant and the respondent do you have any witnesses do you have any information do you have anything uh, to offer and there is nothing mm. so then if we if we follow the the structure of look i cannot i as the ic cannot find enough information about this so therefore i uh, i will in my report say that uh, you know this harassment did not occur does that automatically mean that i am penalizing the complainant i mean mm. like being for the respondent is that that it, can that be seen as i see being against the complainant or or recommending action against the complainant okay yeah so one the act very clearly says that if the ic finds a person not guilty it doesn't mean that the complaint was false or frivolous uh -huh. now the act uh, has uh, provisions for what to do when there is a false or frivolous complaint and the woman could be punished for it for a in the same way as how a man could be punished for harassment right the punishment is almost the same mm -hmm. but that's a very high threshold to meet simply an allegation being proved as not true does not make the mm -hmm. complaint false or frivolous and that's very very clear from the wording of the law itself this so and i think uh, women aggrieved women should feel confident that any finding of not guilty doesn't automatically make them guilty and ic's should be able to also make the conclusion of not guilty for lack of evidence right you don't have to give the because your uh, report will be on record forever you don't have to give the accused a clean chit if you don't think there is a clean chit there you found him not guilty due to lack of evidence you can state that not it's not guilty for the lack of evidence and not because you found evidence in his favor so that's the it's about the manner in which you write it and that's perfectly fine so yeah i guess that's where the ic needs to finally land uh, there are a multiple multiple kinds of evidence that you can access which we discussed but if you've gone through all of your options and still don't have anything then unfortunately you don't find guilt purely based on the word of the woman mm -hmm. right because uh, you need to at least meet the threshold of preponderance of probabilities balance of convenience and merely the word doesn't achieve that but the fact is you have so many tools to use the word of the woman to find in her favor mm. and if you've not been able to do all of that well unfortunate in that case i suppose or maybe the person was genuinely not guilty whatever so so kind of you know i mean we, we we've done this entire thing when i say we i'm talking the ic we we've completed this we the saying we we've created this uh, report and the law also says that a copy of the report has been has to be given to both yeah. the complainant and the respondent so as the complainant if she's not happy with it she can go on appeal right mm. i mean she can say that i'm not happy with the way that my complaint was uh, discharged or was investigated by the posh mm. uh, by the posh committee by the ic and therefore she goes on uh, appeal so it's not speak now or forever hold your silence no absolutely absolutely okay. so the law provides uh, things a 90 day window from the time the decision is made from the time the ic makes the recommendations to file an appeal so there is definitely a period of time uh, that the woman woman can go and appeal it and i should just add here not directly related that many employers sometimes choose to have an internal appeal mechanism as well so that so sometimes women have two Uh, chances to appeal one before your internal appeal mechanism and one before the statutory appeal mechanism so those two options are often available uh, to aggrieved women as well aggrieved women as well as a respondent as opposed yeah. if uh, he feels that he has been wrongly adjudged as guilty yeah. so yeah yeah I mean, Lots and lots to talk about, uh, Bishan, and and I'm definitely going to take you up on some of the points that that you mentioned uh, this time when we catch up in the future. And for all of you out there listening to us, thank you for your time, patience, and support. We're excited about having this conversation. We hope it's useful to you. And do like, subscribe, and come back to us with your comments, your questions, your suggestions, or or even just you know if you disagree with us, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you.